miss this. It's been a while, Ian. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I- I'm happy to be back. Yeah, likewise. Welcome back, guys, to the Muscle by Brain podcast with JPS and Lifting for Life. I'm your host, Jacob Skeppis, and we have Sir Ian McCarthy. Welcome back, Ian. It's been a while. It has been. We're still alive. So that's We're still started. alive. That's the main thing. And guys, this is your podcast for everything evidence-based as it relates to lifting, physique development, and bodybuilding. And today's episode is going to be a little bit different to our previous episodes. We have a Q&A, question and answer, answering a number of questions we've received from some listeners. So without further ado, Ian, let's get into it. Question number one comes from a Martin Rafalo. How does one determine their MRV and MEV? Well, my immediate thought was this would be a question better asked to Mike Isratel. Um, and, and the reason for that, I, I will do my best to answer the question, but I, I do want to note that the reason why I, I had that thought is this, I think – these concepts are real. I mean, I think there is such a thing as the maximum amount of volume you're able to recover from. I I would certainly agree with that. And I do think that there's such a thing as the least amount of volume you can do that generates any positive outcome. I don't find myself using these concepts in my own training or in programming other than I might ask a question like, am I able to recover from this or would this person be able to recover from this, which is equivalent to asking, does this exceed a person's MRV? I would note, and I I read a lengthy uh, comment of Mike Isratel's on this recently, and I I actually completely agreed with him. and, And he talked about the fact that if you were to combine all per body part MRVs into a program, the, the total, um, and you were to train at that level, the total amount of volume you would be doing would exceed the, the, whole, the total body uh, MRV. And that's what I find myself talking about and thinking about more. I find that the limiting factor tends to be systemic central fatigue. It isn't, has this person literally done too many sets of leg curls or something like that, although I do think that's a possibility. So I would say um, in terms of that central or let's say whole body uh, MRV, I do think it's – interestingly, I find that some of the best indicators are perhaps not the super obvious intuitive ones. Things like how do you feel when you first wake up? Mm. Because I – you know. Not that you know, I don't particularly desire or feel like I can pull weight, but I do actually have almost 10 years so of training can experience. I, can I just confirm that, Ian, that when you wake up, the first thing you do is pull? <laughs> Should I know what that means? Is this is this a cultural uh, difference? Should I? Do we have a cultural difference? What do you do first thing in the morning? Pull. I really have no idea what that means. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not I'm going to have to cut this part out. Pull your dick. <laughs> Right. No, I had the, I had that thought. No. Um, well, typically I feel terrible when I, I mean like very depressed when I wake up. But but um, I have found that, and this isn't. I've, I've talked to a number of people about this. If you, one term that I've seen is uh, workout hangover. So if you consist, you know, let's say that you wake up, and I understand most people don't wake up feeling amazing. But let's say that you typically wake up and overall in terms of mood, energy, et cetera, it's like a five out of 10. Um, and then you've been training hard and it's like a, a two. You like, it's like really a, a battle to actually even get out of bed. Well, that would be an indication that perhaps you're, you're doing more than you can recover from chronically. Uh, things like that, things like um, – des- I actually – wrote something up with a colleague of mine, Kevin Butler, a super thorough uh, analysis of like, are you overtrained with a long list of symptoms and, and which do you have and to what degree and so on. Um, I'll see what I end up doing with that. But another good measure is motivation to train. If you are consistently not wanting to train, wanting to come up with reasons not to train, Hey, et cetera, uh, I'm, I'm super tired. Um, 
it's I don't want to just say, okay, that person's lazy. It really could be that they're like perpetually pushing too hard. And so there's actually a really good reason why they don't want to train. Like maybe they actually shouldn't be training that day or should be training less, et cetera. Um, performance through workouts. If someone is consistently really struggling to finish their workouts, mm. like second half of the workout, they're just dead. That tends to be a good indication that they are uh, or that they have exceeded their maximum recovery capacity. Um, yeah, I think I'm realizing that that I should probably find a way to make that material I talked about public, but mm. that would be... Do you also, um, I like to look at bar speed as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially for compound movements such as you know, squats, bench press, things like that. If uh, the bar speed starts slowing down significantly that, you know, at typical weights that move at a, you know, easier RPE, that's a good sign that, you know, somebody could be overreaching. Yeah, I think um, that would, that thought would have been more likely to, you know, come up for me if I had more of a powerlifting angle. Mm. Interestingly, though, I now that you bring that up, I, I think even in the context of hypertrophy training, I noticed that. Mm. And, you know, it's there's a lot of nuance to this. It is not as yes, simple not as, as that, no. like, you know, if, if someone is usually able to bench press uh, 225 pounds for 10 reps and then they go in and they, they can't move 225, okay, that's a huge red flag. But it might be they usually do 225 for 10 like real quick – quick reps excuse me quick reps so you know they're really just like it, they can maybe they could do 15 which starts getting into rpe but let's just talk about the speed might be 10 really solid reps and then some at some later point they come in they do 225 for 10 but they're super slow and they feel it they're they feel like they're like moving through cement or something yeah that could be a suggestion that and that, that and that actually gets more into local like muscular fatigue. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I, I noticed this myself with my pecs, and this has been true of other people to whom I've talked and people I've worked with that the pecs tend to be more sensitive to kind of local fatigue. I think this is because outside of the gym the pecs aren't much used. Mm -hmm. When you think about your the muscles of your legs are used They're pretty dormant. around. Mm. Right, and uh, whereas with your pecs, you have to struggle a bit to think of what they're doing kind of day to day. Um, so I, I find that what they need, uh, it, uh, the level of effective volume is typically lower, and the maximum amount of volume that someone can do before their performance starts degrading is lower as well. So I found that um, my... Really what happened was the, the chest work I was doing, I was still able to do it, but it felt terrible. I mean, really bad. And I just knew, okay, this is, I, I shouldn't keep this up because maybe something bad will happen. So again, it's a lot of nuance to it. And I realized that's a, a lengthy and not super mm. concrete answer. Because again, I think that there are many things to consider. A couple more that I'll mention. Mental fatigue is a surprisingly good indicator of someone being, uh, I don't want to say overtrained because you overtraining syndrome, it seems a very extreme uh, condition. Very serious. For, if, yeah, if you read what actually meets that uh, standard. But overreaching, so just in the sense of so, for some period of time, someone has been doing more than they can recover from. Um, again, mental fatigue. So... Your performance in the gym might actually be where it should be in terms of you're doing what you think you should be doing, but you're, you just feel very unfocused outside of the gym. And again, it's a really surprisingly good indicator there have been, I'm able now to look back to periods where I was overreaching and it was affecting everything I was doing outside of the gym and I, I didn't make the connection, but now I'm able to. And what else? And not being able to get a good pump. I mm. have no idea why this is, That's but I've seen it happen point. so many times. Mm -hmm. So even when you do this, the single joint high rep stuff, you just don't get as good of a pump. I imagine that has something to do with a, an exaggerated or greater stress response and that that somehow affects um, blood flow. Blood flow. Yeah. Also, 
sleep disturbances. They can, they can go in a variety of directions. So some people struggle to get to sleep. Some people sleep much more. They still feel fatigued, etc. cetera. Um, that's, that's what I can recall at the moment. For sure. So that's, that's all to the MRV point. Mm. And with regard to MEV, I honestly struggle to answer this question, not in the sense of I struggle to answer it on a podcast, but like really fundamentally asking myself that question because it can be really, mm. let's, let's even put MEV. So that's minimal or that, um, MEV. MED, I guess, is what that would be, minimum effective dose. Let's put that aside and let's just ask the question of, is your current training working? Well, if the outcome that you're looking for is hypertrophy, it can be really hard to know mm. whether in, you might – you really you, – you might think that your training is working, but you might actually be losing muscle to some minor degree that's totally outside the scope of what you can discern mm. in the gym – and with photos and so on, I mean, there's a reason why we have very sophisticated measures of muscle, muscle uh, thickness and volume now that you know used in the research to discern differences. You know, this protocol caused a 12% increase and a 7%. Do you think you're going to notice that in practice? Um, mm. I, I think it's probably just no. Um, so, and that's... That's actually asking an easier question to answer. Is your training even working? If you're asking the question now of what is the absolute least you can do and still generate some positive outcome, I don't, I, I don't think we can answer that in mm. practice. And one thing that's been noted, I think it was Greg Knuckles who originally said this, um, the idea that minimum effective dose means literally the very lowest amount of volume that generates a beneficial outcome, that's you know, literally true, but not really what people mean. That's perhaps an uncharitable interpretation of it. And when you think about someone like Eric Helms, who's perceived as being more of a minimum effective dose guy, I don't think Eric thinks you should do the absolute least you can and still make progress. Rather, he would, I think he would say something like, do an amount which reliably generates progress and isn't pushing your recovery capacity, at least not usually. Mm. And so I think that's, that's going to be more than that absolute minimum amount. Um, and I think... Honestly, I think in practice, where you're going to end up being, kind of where you want to, what you want to shoot for, is perpetually pretty close to the maximum amount of volume that you can recover from overall. Mm. And perhaps at some points you want to push it a little bit more. But I've not been convinced that when it comes to hypertrophy training in particular, that it's it's and you know this gets outside the scope of this discussion, but I'll, I'll end with um, I think that the way to go is again to perpetually kind of be at like eighty five percent, and which by the way leaves you kind of a cushion for hey you got an hour less sleep today, but you can still do what you need to do because what you did last time was eighty five percent of what you could do, so today it's ninety eight percent, but you can sense. still do it and recover from it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, that's the fundamentally that's the reason why I would go with that. I think it's effective and sustainable. Awesome, that was a really thorough response. And I guess something important to just add on that before we move on to the next question is that you know the maximum amount of work you can do isn't a static figure. It's very much mm -hmm. dynamic, and you know programming needs to be adjusted accordingly to you know compensate for many factors that influence our recovery and so forth. So. Question number two, I don't know if Evan Godby is trolling or not, but he asks, he's, he's known for trolling, he asks, does the mind-muscle connection exist? Evan, if you're trolling, I'm going to kick your ass when I see you next. I, I, I don't think he is. I, I no, think it's I a, a legitimate question. Also, I, I troll him 10 times more via DM, uh, <laughs> so I, I, get, I get the prize for that one. But mind-muscle connection. It's yes, a hot topic I think at the moment. so. I think um, I think it depends on what we mean, mm. but 
I can't think of a definition of a mind muscle connection, which kind of makes any sense as a definition that anyone would use and is contradicted by the scientific evidence. So if we define it as something like, and, and I'm considering everything that I know, so I'm considering the scientific evidence in, in framing it this way, but I would say um, it's roughly the ability to consciously alter for sharing and or uh, muscle activity. Now, I won't get into an extensive discussion of, of well, I'll just put it like this. Um, the, I think the, the weight of EMG or the weight that is assigned to EMG research is uh, easy to uh, exaggerate. It's easy to assign greater weight to it than is <clears throat> actually justified by the scientific evidence. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and Andrew Vygotsky actually published it was a letter to the editor recently or had published a letter to the editor which argued that we can't reasonably make the inference of EMG equals motor unit recruitment equals hypertrophic potential single quote on on either end, which I think traditionally is what a lot of people have done. And from as far as I know, Andrew is really one of the most knowledgeable people in this area. So I again, I think we need to be – hesitant to say, okay, this, if you do this, a 10% greater um, electrical activity measured by EMG, therefore 10% greater hypertrophic potential. But I think that if, if we have, and we do actually have scientific evidence that shows that given different internal cueing, you can change EMG outcomes, um, then that is consistent with there being such a thing as a mind muscle connection. I think it's very much context it, dependent, isn't it? Like exercise specific, rep range specific, you know, load specific. Like, you know, the mind muscle connection is not necessarily going to be something that's present or, you know, that force sharing with a one rep max on the squat. You know what I mean? Like, you can't right. connect the mind to the muscle. There are so many other factors that influence, you know, force output um, as opposed to just contracting muscle. Yeah, so. There, there's a study that um, tested EMG looking at both the pecs and the triceps with bench press. I think it was 60 or 65% of one rep max in one group and 85% of one rep max in another. And there does appear to be a greater ability to um, alter relative EMG with lighter weight, mm. which... I don't think that we could draw a line straight from that to force sharing. Force sharing, by the way, means you know, in in bench pressing 225 pounds for however many repetitions, all of the muscles involved in that have to generate a certain amount of force, and the amount of force for which one muscle is responsible relative to another. And if you're if you were able to shift more of that toward your pecs, say, then then that would they would be simulated to a greater degree relative, not, you couldn't say relative to the triceps, but relative to what they would have been exposed to otherwise. Um, But yeah, that, that, that our ability to do that does appear to be diminished with heavier loads. Although interestingly, even with that 85% work, there was some effect. I do think that, you know, once we're getting to something like the one rep max, it's, I think that you can, I think there's some ability to change um, the involvement of muscles with a one rep max if you're deliberately somehow changing your form. Mm, I I think that's about as far as we can go with it. Mm. Otherwise, um, given it's a one rep max, every muscle involved is going to be um, contributing to the maximum maximal extent possible. Motor unit recruitment, correct. Right. Um, Although... Motor unit recruitment is getting a little bit away from this topic, but I, I thought about it a couple of times yeah. and mentioned it. So interestingly, I did, answer, uh, I did ask Andrew about this, and he said that he's seen data showing that even with as heavy as a 90% of a one rep max, you do get greater motor unit recruitment as you get closer to failure. Mm-hmm. So that 
I'm not sure anymore, I would say, that if it's heavy enough that you get literally 100% motor unit recruitment from the very first rep. Mm. Maybe. Maybe with a true one rep max. But based on that discussion, it seems that maybe it's possible that even with genuinely very heavy training, you still need to get yeah. um, to failure to, to get full motor unit recruitment. Now, my muscle connection, again, we see that with... Uh, Particular internal cueing, you see changes in EMG, you see changes in relative EMG in some cases. So if it's something like a knee extension, aka a leg extension, it's a single joint exercise. The quadriceps are responsible for that. So you're not looking at quadriceps activity relative to something else because something else isn't involved. But you can look at um, EMG activity in, in the quadriceps. With something like bench press, again, we're able to look at uh, relative activity of, say, the triceps and the, the pecs, and there's some evidence there consistent with the mind-muscle connection. I would, um, I'm would, i very interested to see a lot more here, and I think really what would be ideal, and we can always, whatever the question, you, could, you can uh, conceive of better research that we would want, but it would be really interesting to see actual outcome studies where uh, people are given different try to control everything else for some reason pull downs are coming to mind like let's say you have one group 70 percent one rep max pull downs volume equated and so on and one group is, is just given instructions on or with regard to how to do pull downs with good form mm. so you would want the form to be Stand visibly up. as similar right. as possible because if internal cueing is changing form, then it's confounded by form. Yeah, 100%. So you would want two groups where it looks the same, but one group is thinking about depressing your scapula, uh, contract your lats, and so on, and and actually look at um, hypertrophic outcomes. Mm -hmm. It would probably be easier to do with either a knee extensors, so quads or triceps or something like that. But yeah, it's a very interesting field, isn't it? And the most recent edition of Mass uh, looked at yes. this in quite a lot of detail. Shout out to Mass. Check it out. Yeah, highly recommend. And the next question is related to uh, improved nutrient uptake. So Connor Sheeply asks, vasodilators after a workout to improve nutrient uptake within a cell due to improving blood flow without having to worry about the generally poor level of gastric emptying whilst training. Ian? Right. So first of all, I, I want to say that it, it's a uniquely interesting question. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, not that the question is there my muscle connection isn't uh, worthwhile, but th this is the kind of question I haven't seen before. Um, I, first of all, I'm skeptical of a significant recovery benefit to uh, vasodilation in terms of improved nutrient uptake and so on. Um, I'm not going to say it doesn't occur that that is not a real benefit, but, um, and indeed there is, like one of the citrulline malate studies showed a decrease in delayed onset muscle soreness, mm. but I don't feel comfortable speculating as to the mechanism for that. So again, I, I'm very much open to be convinced, but I haven't been convinced that's a benefit. Now, interestingly, with regard to the poor blood flow during exercise resulting from blood being uh, directed toward the muscle responsible for the exercise, it's been about a year since I've looked at it, but if I recall correctly, there's a study on citrulline in particular. So not citrulline malate, but just citrulline, which is a vasodilator, and that, it actually showed that supplementation with citrulline diminished that effect because of vasodilation. So the, the effect of uh, blood flow to the GI tract being diminished by exercise was significantly mitigated. I think it was actually like decreased to nothing, but again, I need to take a look at it again. So my suggestion would be take it before exercise, You'll get a better pump. In some cases, better performance. It depends on what we're talking about mm. because there are a variety of compounds that do this. And so take it before. They, they will exert their effects actually before you start training, throughout the training session, and then they'll 
again, it's going to depend on the compound, but might still exert an effect afterwards. So I think that's uh, that's the way to go. That's what I do. And obviously, what I do is like the thing exactly. that everyone do, should do. Do as Ian does. <laughs> And the next question I am was, does glutamine and leucine degrade by being heated up? And is the quality affected through the heating process? This was from Amy Karlstrom. Yeah, interestingly, I don't know. And it struck me that it's funny to me that I don't know because it's pr- probably a more basic, much more basic question than like a lot of the stuff I think about. But um, my understanding is that you know, when you talk about protein, there are a number of different things to consider. If we're and the question was about leucine and glutamine, so my understanding is that the amino acids themselves are not going to be uh, damaged. Um, for one thought that comes to mind, and I, I really am approaching this kind of like a lay person because I haven't investigated this, but if it were damaging to amino acids, then wouldn't that exert that effect if every time someone cooks meat or something like this and I have never heard of that being Mm. a phenomenon or seen any evidence for it I do think or I've read my understanding is that in the case of something like whey protein there are um, bioactive compounds in it that are damaged by heat but that isn't you know, if the reason why that's being ingested is it, it contains these amino acids, then I don't think that that's a problem. Mm. So I think you can go in, you know, barring a better understanding, which I don't have, I think you can go in one of two directions. Well, you have two different directions, pick one. One would be the better safe than sorry. And if it make you know, maybe it will make a 0.005% difference, uh, then don't do it. And honestly, that's probably what I would do because I'm uh, weird. And I would, t- I would take the hit. Um, but so, you know, it's reflective of my psychology. But I, I think probably the, the more reasonable approach to, in which to go is, okay, you're still getting the protein. Mm-hmm. In the absence of good evidence that the protein is being damaged in a way that will cause it to be ineffective, you know, not exert the effects of consuming protein, I would not worry about it. I, I'll, I will um, – I'll put this on the list of things that I want to investigate and might get to. Yeah, I, I, very, I very much agree with you there. I have looked into it previously because I, for some reason I get asked this very, very regularly. So um, from what I have found, there's no uh, complete uh, disruption to the functionality of the protein, although some of the uh, proteins do get, you know, destroyed through the heating process, it doesn't actually um, have a negative impact in the functionality of the protein. So that's what I do know. So not a lot to worry about there, but yeah, if you want to be better than safe and sorry, just don't heat it up, I guess, Amy. Right. (laughs) Now, this was a really good question I had um, asked me from Erin Pinder, and she asked over through our Facebook page, and the question was, how best to design a program for someone who gets bored easily and still wants to build muscle? And I really like this question because I think this is possibly one of the biggest issues that most people face uh, with trying to train purely for hypertrophy is getting sick of doing the same damn thing for you know weeks and months on end. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an awesome question and it is – it's one which probably has a lot more in the way of practical application than so many of the technical questions that I, I love considering. Um, I think there are two ways to go that come to mind immediately. One is write a program that you stick to but change it frequently. Now, one can make an argument I think is a good argument that that might slow down long-term progress because – You'll get used to an exercise. You'll kind of get in the groove. You'll change it. Although I think I think the degree to which that happens can be exaggerated. Mm. This is something that um, Greg Knuckles and I posted about in a not together. He was in the thread, and I was in the thread, and we agreed that. And oftentimes, it only takes like one session to get back in the groove of doing a different exercise. Mm. But that is still something that you want to need to do if, if you're consistent. And you know, clear progress on something, let's just say a squat. You know, over time, even if you're training for hypertrophy, 
you you want things to be increasing. And if you're doing a squat for two weeks and then something else for two weeks, it gets a lot harder to uh, to progress on that given there's such significant periods in which you aren't doing it. But I think the rebuttal to that would be is kind of embedded in the question, and that would be, well, if someone hates it, if they're not doing it, whatever, right. you know, it might be they are doing it but really don't enjoy it. And then you need to ask the question of which is more important, the person's happiness or optimizing progress. Mm. Very important, serious question to ask. Um, or you might have someone who literally just won't do it, in which case it's a moot point because this theoretically optimal approach, they're not going to do it. Mm. So it, it's entirely practically irrelevant. Um, so again, I think that's one way to go about it is write a program, stick to it for whatever period you need to know yourself, so maybe it's four weeks. I do think, by the way, that for a lot of people, I was going to mention. Is re- sorry, and I yeah. was going to mention how important self awareness is in yeah. answering this question. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Oh, totally. I, I think um, occasionally I'll have a discussion where someone is doing what they perceive as being the right thing in the sense of this is what they need to do for their progress, etc., and they. I either just outright hate it or there's there's very significant just dislike. Mm. You know, it might not be this overwhelming emotional like, oh, absolutely. But, but just they're clearly not having any fun and like perpetually kind of they're, they're doing it. But why? Basically, mm. physically, you know, why are you like you're not getting anything out? Like you might be making the physical progress, but it isn't um, – the like you're not enjoying the process so and what's interesting is sometimes people don't they they seem not to recognize that it's even kind of a thing that they're allowed to say this isn't working for me as a person Mm. you know in terms of my personality and so on so yeah that's important and um my other thought was and this is something i've been thinking about otherwise and, and i've been trying to figure out how best to actually program for is designing a flexible program where you're able to swap things out, maybe even one day to the next. Mm. So you might have a, you might have, this is your training week. You hit your lower body three times, upper body three times. And then you have, you have your workouts in terms of knee dominant, leg exercise, hip hinge, et cetera. But maybe you have slots where you can actually swap things out. So in my mind, what would be ideal would be, you know, something like a squat. I, I don't want someone doing a squat Monday and then a week later, mm. um, leg press. And you, I would really rather, okay, just do the squat. But, but maybe there's a slot later in the workout where otherwise I would have just said knee extension, knee extension, et cetera. Maybe mm. it's knee extension or a lunge or a split squat. And just make sure that you're using appropriate load and that your RP is where it needs to be, et cetera. And I think that, honestly, I, I doubt that someone would notice a difference in terms of hypertrophy between those two approaches. And if they're a lot happier and more engaged, et cetera, that's a big win. Yeah. That, and the last point you brought up there is something I actually do with my programming uh, for individuals who struggle with boredom or you know just need to have a more lively workout and this is a concept I got from 3DMJ uh, through a discussion I had with uh, Eric Helms a while back, was having priority one exercises, which remain consistent in the program, such as the squat, then having priority two, which would be a movement pattern of a specific sort, which have the flexibility between one or two different exercises, depending on what you're feeling, and then priority three exercises, which is a muscle group, and you can do whatever the hell you want, so to speak, and having a little bit more fun, and then having you know less, say, two sets prescribed as opposed to a set two by ten. It's just two sets and go for feel, so to speak. And I've found that to be a really great way to program uh, for these people who struggle uh, to stick to a program because they get bored because it does have that structure that we need to see progress, but it also gives them some freedom um, to choose exercises that they enjoy and so forth. So hopefully that helps you, Aaron. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly um, wise way to approach it because 
it's, you know, is someone going to notice a significant difference if one week they do squat, one week do, they do leg press, next week they do lunges, etc.? Yes, they're not going to progress on any of them. Uh, so that's, I think that is something where you're, if any, you know, if you're going to notice slowed progress from anything, it would be something like that. I mean, other than not going to the gym. Mm. Uh, whereas if, if it's uh, biceps curls, yeah, I mean, I, I've in my own training, if that's you know. To, to some extent, I would say what someone actually does is kind of the, the real test of what they b- believe. Um, yeah, there are cases where I will plan a certain kind of curl, and I'm just like, I just really don't want to do that. So I'll go and do another one. Now, the next week, I'll probably do what I planned, mm. but I don't think I'm at a disadvantage as a result of doing something a little bit different. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, there needs to be large practicality uh consideration with program design for hypertrophy for anyone who's not a natural pro bodybuilder or you know a robot so to speak because the the reality is a lot of people just hate you know sticking to routine and a rigid uh training program or not that they hate it that they you know they like change people like thing you know shiny new toy like a new program comes out and people get excited about that because they get to do new things and i think yeah right. balancing that is very tough as a coach and when you want to get results something i do want to note though because i've been having a lot of discussions recently about flexible dieting well it's really even more broad than that dieting generally and i've, I've had a lot of discussions with people where i've said things like it is extremely important that you do something that for the most part you enjoy mm. and because certainly there are going to be moments where you just need to do something that isn't fun if you're going to generate the, the best outcome. And you, so you want something that overwhelmingly you enjoy, that you can sustain, etc. But, 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 but hard work and consistency mm. and organization uh, really, really pay off. So... I do. Th- I think it's important to note there's a real risk of going too far in the direction of saying, "Well, the thing that you know, the pinnacle, the most important thing is uh, enjoyment, and so on." Because if you know, if it just kind of results in chaos, if it results in chaos and the person is super happy and they almost kind of don't even care what the physical result is, perhaps, and um, okay, but if it is at least kind of a seven out of 10 in terms of importance to them that they also make really good progress. Then there are going to be instances where it's just like you, you would prefer to do this, but Hey, this is what needs to happen. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree because you can't measure progress. If you're continually jumping from one thing to the next, it's very hard to assess any, you know, change and then make adjustments to continue progress when you stall. And I a hundred percent agree that there, there needs to be a certain level of, consistency and commitment to whatever the cause is um and the flexibility and sustainability is a you know is a additional consideration to that not necessarily overriding that consistency in the first Mm -hmm. place question number six this one comes from one jacob skepis don't know who he is and this was a question I had for you, Ian, based on my contest prep uh, as it stands now in the off-season, because you've posted recently about carbohydrate intake uh, when bulking and how after two weeks of overfeeding carbohydrates and fats that the body alters breakdown and oxidization and essentially adjusts everything with no significant difference in body composition. So my question to you, Ian, is what are... What is your go-to when increasing calories um, for me? I would say that carbs get manipulated more, probably fundamentally because they're a non-essential nutrient. Now, there is some increasing discussion. I mean, one question that's asked is, um, it, like is fiber an essential nutrient that's categorized as a carbohydrate? Should we say that non-fiber carbohydrates are non-essential, et cetera? Yeah. But um, I think the overwhelming majority of protein research is done based on body weight. So in that context, uh, protein intake might change as someone's body weight changes from 
because I mean, literally they'll be gaining weight. So if you're basing that recommendation on um, a body weight figure, then, then that would scale up, but not, you know, if someone goes from 180 pounds and you're going with, let's just say one, one gram per pound, they go from 180 to 190. Okay. So that's a 10% difference, but their energy intake might go up by 800 calories in that period. And, and so uh, the, the, 10 gram difference does not account for the 800 additional calories per day. And I would note that I think there's a good argument to be made for skewing protein a little higher when bulking because more of that protein is going to be coming from lower quality sources. Mm. And a lot of protein recommendations are based on an assumption of high quality protein sources. Indeed, sometimes it's just whey. A lot of the studies done on acute muscle protein synthesis, it's just whey, it's just casein, it's a blend, mm. which doesn't reflect a meal where you have a protein shake and some carb sources that also have protein, but it's drastically lower quality and so on. So I think that's a reasonable argument for skewing protein a little bit higher, but even then that wouldn't account for all that difference. Fat, I think um, I've been a little more aggressive in the sense of going higher with fat over the past year than previously because I do think that there are benefits in terms of hormonal effects. I think this is fairly, uh, the phrase that came to mind was like not pin downable in the sense of kind of vague, subjective, but mm. oftentimes people will just feel better with pushing their fat intake up a little bit more. Um, but I also think that, I think with fat, you, you can reach a point where higher than a certain intake is, is just kind of gross to yeah. consume. <laughs> I mean, like really. Yeah. Uh, which When you go to add olive oil to your cereal and things like that, it's a bad time. Right. So <laughs> I, like, I got to, I think, 120 grams of fat earlier this year bulking. Now, actually, the reason why I went a little bit, I, I reduced it a little bit, is I noticed fat gain, which... I think I'm trying to remember now, but I think even given equal calorie intake, I looked better with carbs being a little bit higher, fat a little bit lower, which I would also acknowledge is pretty like how exactly do you discern what's going on there? But again, typically you, you kind of hit ceilings for protein and fat where I'm not able to articulate a good argument for going higher. And then if calories need to go higher, the addition would be carbs. Also very, very, very often, People just love eating carbs. Mm, they're easier to so, uh, ingest as well. You know, you know, in terms of in comparison to protein, anyway. You know, adding, you know, glucose and dextrose to you know shakes and whatnot is a lot easier than having to consume additional protein and whatnot. Right. I think it. I think it can be. I might go as far as to say that's generally true. I, however, it, it's interesting how much it varies between individuals mm. because some people just love eating protein, you know, like steak, 16 ounces of steak. Like, why should it bother if it isn't yeah. that much? Um, they, you know, they want like 50 to 70 grams of protein in every meal. So there have been cases where I've said to people, I think more often when people eat a ton of protein, it's because they think they have to and they don't. Mm. So I've had cases where um, I, I would take 100 grams of protein off of someone's intake like from one day to the next. Just like that's, I think it's all superfluous. It's yeah. like, shift that all over to other macros. But, but again, there are people who genuinely like it. And I think that that would be a reason to go higher. I think and fat can be, if the issue is some, you know, someone needing to eat enough, I think fat can help. I think moderating protein can help generally. I think adding what, what I've always called easy carbs, you know, this I knew so little five years ago relative to now. It just, it's horrible. But something I knew, even at that point, was easy carbs. it's easy to get calories from cereal, bagels, pasta. For me, even rice, although it's actually pretty high volume. Don't try to bulk with potatoes. They have the highest satiating yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, so I think, yeah, typically I, I kind of find baseline intakes for... Mm. Protein and fat, those certainly can go up, but carbs are the most variable. Um, with the exception of 
once someone's deep in a cut, I've been more aggressive about cutting fat, interestingly, because you're able to do food volume becomes very, very important, mm. trying to uh, decrease energy density of, of your diet. And one of the ways to do that is to decrease fat and take all else staying or remaining the same. So yes, not relevant to your question, but it's interesting. No, no, that definitely is interesting because the reason I ask is as training gets harder and harder and obviously calories are remaining pretty constant and when body weight does go up, and then plateau, and training continues to get harder from there. Um, if we increase calories, the reason I ask is, is it more beneficial to then increase from carbohydrates as opposed to fat from a recovery standpoint once those minimum requirements have been met, considering that there's no real difference in you know body composition or fat gain um, after you've been dieting for over two weeks, you know, overfeeding these macros? I'm not sure because I think the what many people would say in this position is carbs are the way to go because carbs improve performance. But we need to remember the context here. Mm. We're talking about someone bulking, they reach a plateau, they need to be eating more. So this isn't someone who's like starving and you're adding exactly a, bit, right. a bit, you know, a good it's chunk of different. carbs. Mm. You, you, yeah, you know, you're not taking someone from like 100 to 150 which is a That's 50% huge. increase in their carb intake. What, you know, if someone's already at 450, then adding 25, 50 grams of carbs, whatever it might be, is much less significant. And yeah, so I, I, um, I mean, I say that, but at the, at the same time, I would note, kind of, to, you know, argue in both directions, but I, I can notice the difference between, say, 500 and 600 grams of carbs per day. You mentioned but, the other day. But, Right. But I'm not sure that I can really say that it's not just the energy making the difference because I haven't tried, yeah. hey, I'm going to get the extra 400 calories from, from protein and fat. So I do think that – It's an energy factor more so the specific macronutrient. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think that becomes increasingly the case the more someone is eating, whereas if someone is in a controlled – you know. They're dieting, controlled starvation. Yeah. Then every decision, you know, <laughs> some. I mean, I, I legitimately there have been cases where I'm like sitting at the computer, like, should I change this by five, you know, twenty or twenty five grams of carbs? Because what what might the implications be in terms of changes and so on? Whereas um, with with someone in, in the deep off season, you might not even notice a difference between super rigid tracking and not tracking at all. Yeah assuming that they do that in a responsible way. So, yeah, I think it, I think assuming certain minimum intakes that are going to vary based on the individual are there, probably the main thing is going to be what the person want to do. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll add some carbs then. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Well, guys, that was all we had for today. We're almost uh, up for time. So, Ian, thank you very much again for your time today. Guys, that was episode number nine of the Muscle by Brain podcast. We're almost up to episode 10, and thank you all for listening. Make sure that you like this video. Comment if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer in future Q&A videos, and we'll be sure to speak to you next time. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you.